All right, welcome back to the channel, everybody. Apologize for my voice. It's all kinds of distorted because I got sick, but I'm pushing through my sore throat to go ahead and record this for you guys now. And again, this is going to be one of the more podcasty type videos or audio casts. So go ahead and have this open in a separate tab and go ahead and work on stuff while you're listening because it's primarily just going to be audio, the visual backdrops basically just going to shift around every once in a while. Maybe I'll throw in a, a meme or two here or there, have them flash on the screen for like a fraction of a second, just as a gag to fish out anyone who actually stared at the screen the whole time. But as usual, if you're new and you like hearing about topics dealing with energy and natural resources, resource depletion, commodity prices, future outlooks, then this is one of the channels for you. So go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell and stick around here. And new and old viewers alike, if you want to support the channel, or really just my ability to eat, then a paypal.me is in the description down below. But regardless, here we go. The good old days. Oh, how we all miss them. And even many young people who weren't even really alive, or rather sentient, during the good old days, aka the late 50s through the early 2000s, are consciously aware that they missed them too, or at least that they would have been better off in those times. But the good old days are never coming back. No matter what any politician or political party promises you, but why? Whatever happened to the good old days? Why, even though we've recovered from the collapse of 08, why does it seem to feel like for a most people, why does it feel like we really haven't and life is harshly less affordable or at least less easily affordable than it used to be for several decades? Well, bear with me here. Uh, we're going to have to start from the ground up, but basically to start from as a foundation, no matter what overlaying secondary and tertiary illusory economics we put on top of everything, at the foundation, there are only three primary things. There is energy, resources, and time. Now, for the greater span of human history, up until the Industrial Revolution, we relied in one way or another on current energy, aka the direct incoming energy into our environment. And for most of our history, that was in the form of food, whether fed to humans or fed to animals, whichever one of us actually ended up doing the labor, but we were stuck with current energy. However many crops could be grown that year right then and there with the available sunlight falling on the field. And when dealing with current energy, you typically need to dedicate a lot of resources and time to accessing it in whatever form you're getting it from. Because it's sparse, it's dispersed, it's not compacted, it hasn't been condensed. It's more laborious to get a hold of, or at least to get a hold of and then to utilize, and a large portion of that energy has to be redirected into the acquisition of the next round of current energy. For most of our history, this came in the fact that, uh, we grew the food to feed ourselves, and uh, typically, somewhere upwards of 90% of the population before modern farming and fertilizers and equipment and all that, typically upwards of 90% of an area's population had to work in agriculture. And those days were not these uh, liberally negotiable work days of today. Those were hard 10, 12 plus hour work days. So it was also constantly consuming a lot of the third factor, time. Most of our time was going towards growing food, aka the acquisition of energy. And the majority of that food, because the majority of the population were farm workers in one way or another, or herders or livestock raisers, the majority of the food the energy was consumed by those people and thus was, because it had to be, being put right back into acquiring more energy. Now very recently, historically speaking, over the last two centuries or so, we've managed 
to break this cycle. And boy, was it a dark tunnel to break out from into the sunny world above. What was it that allowed us to do this? Well, it was the things that uh, the majority of society now hates. Fossil hydrocarbons. Yes, I will say it now. I don't care whether you like them or not. They are the superior energy source. What made and still makes them different, what about them allowed us to truly punch out, is that they are an external excess. They're an overload of energy that we could pull in from outside of the present cycle. They are the condensed, compacted, stored energy from ages upon ages of past cycles. So when we finally began to really utilize these things, the world became forever changed. We were now finally dealing with double-digit and even triple-digit energy returns. The short version of energy return on energy invested. Basically remembering the whole 90% of the population being needed to manually farm, so most of the food or the energy went back in to the production of more energy. That's an example of a, uh, a pathetic energy return. Somewhere between just barely above one for one, maybe up to one for two, if you're lucky. So expend one unit of energy into getting the source of energy, and you get two units back, so you have one unit of excess that you can then use to do something other than just get more energy. So when the age of fossil hydrocarbons began, aka the Industrial Revolution up until present day, we were set free, because now we were dealing with Anything from 1 for 10 up to 1 for 200 and beyond, depending on the type of fossil hydrocarbon, whether it was oil, coal, or gas, and what type of deposit of that particular hydrocarbon type, where it was located. And so from there, we were further and further set free. As the inventions, the new machines, powered in one way or another by the fossil hydrocarbons, were invented along the way, you know, motorized vehicles came along, and particularly for the farm equipment, we now have modern massive farming vehicles that do the year's work of a thousand men in a single day. You know, that just for one example frees up a lot of people and a lot of time. You now have those thousand other people making all kinds of other things or performing all kinds of other services and all else that are now able to actually exist. And because we have so much excess energy, we're no longer dealing with current energy. We're no longer dealing with this tiny amount that all just has to get thrown right back into farming anyways. And thus with it, we've created the entire modern world that now exists around you. So life was very quickly getting better and better. Workdays began shrinking. Peasantry slowly began to fade away. Everything as a whole was getting better. And then there was a stall for a few decades in the first half of the 20th century because of two nameless events that everyone likely knows about. But after the second of those was done and things started rolling again, the days again kept getting more and more golden. We now had so much excess energy we could do so much with and the massive mining machines and equipment that we fuel with hydrocarbons allowed us and still allow us to dig up such enormous quantities of metals and materials so quickly that we were able to start building so many more things. You know, as the good old days began in the 50s or so, we were even being relieved of the labor of having to manually wash our clothes and our dishes. And so we rode this out for a solid five decades or so, until it basically reached its height in the 90s, and then, as the 2000s came, it started arcing up and over the top of the hill, until we passed up and over the peak quality of life or peak prosperity curve. So the reason this happened, or at least the centerpiece of it, was the first global oil production peak, which occurred between 2005 and 2008. You see, for any particular individual oil field, it's, you know, a big underground reservoir under pressure. So you drill in, puncture some holes in it, 
and by its own natural pressure, oil is going to start flowing up through the wells. And obviously, the more wells you keep drilling, the more oil keeps coming up, the output levels keep climbing, until after a while you reach a certain point where enough of the oil has drained out of the reservoir that its pressure has dropped down to a, such a point where even though you're still adding new wells, the output stops going up and starts decreasing. And obviously then continues decreasing from there on as the amount of oil still continues to be less and less, and thus the pressure remains less and less. Although, of course, you can stall this out, drag it out with enhanced recovery measures, like injecting water into the field to repressurize it, but that only is going to do so much for you. So that's a production peak for a single oil field. Now, for an individual country or an area, over time, all of the uh, collective fields and everything that's going on in there, the sort of grand total sum of all their increases and decreases, will produce a national or regional oil production curve that eventually peaks as well. Now, this then obviously applies on the global scale, that we would eventually hit a global production peak. And we hit one in 2005, and oil production stalled up until 2008. And demand for a multi-year period overshot supply by over a million barrels a day and up to two million barrels a day. Now, oil production has since then uh, continued rising because of the effects of that, which was skyrocketing oil prices that the oil industry was then able to pour into the development of a bunch of new oil sources, unconventional, but we'll get to that in a second. So that then thus began raising up global oil production again, but it just hasn't been the same since then that was and that was kind of the that was kind of the fundamental moment that uh that was the defining period of the good old days are over or rather i guess the golden age now looking back at it as our past now we'll refer to it as the good old days back when life was affordable so oil kind of is the primary centerpiece because it's what everything else depends on. Even our access to and extraction of the other two fossil hydrocarbons is dependent on petroleum, as the liquid fuel is just the best one. It can be transported, stored, and carried in a regular container, in a regular fuel tank in its natural state. It doesn't need to be cooled and compressed like natural gas, and liquid fuel is directly combusted itself as the fuel source. It doesn't require a whole bunch of extra machinery to act upon a liquid medium for it, like coal does when we first ran trains on coal. Coal has to enact its action through steam by boiling water. When using liquid fuel, there's no additional medium added. There's no separation. Because with each degree of separation between the initial energy and the work being done, there is a loss of efficiency. So oil production began rising again and has gone up by another 20 million barrels per day since then. But it hasn't really mattered because it's not the same kind of oil. Remember when I said at the beginning the uh, type, location, and quality of the resource or energy source affected the, the energy return level? Well, for most of the good old days or the golden age, we were dealing with really high energy yield oil. Because for most of that time, we were dealing with land-based, not offshore. We were dealing with on-land, near-surface, high naturally pressurized reservoirs of pure good old sweet crude. Obviously, or at least hopefully obvious, under the conditions I just listed, not all that much has to be done or has to be put in to get a hold of it. Now, as our demand grew over time beyond what those sources could provide, we started, you know, slowly venturing into other things, started dipping our toes and stuff. We started drilling deeper reservoirs, started drilling less pressurized reservoirs, started going for some offshore stuff, but never that much and never really that 
out there. Now, however, in the 21st century, basically all of the new oil production being added is all out there and uh, not high yield stuff. Now, all of the new stuff we're adding, 20 million barrels a day of production that's been added since that first peak, and technically more than that, since it also has had to fill in the gap of declining conventional crude production, all of the new stuff is things like deep water and ultra deep water far offshore fields, not so pure, not so sweet crude, miry high sulfur content stuff, extra heavy, extra viscous, really difficult to pump and extract stuff like what's in Venezuela, and the most famous of them all, shale, which as is probably common knowledge by now, we have to drill down, go sideways, and then waste a bunch of water blasting the rocks open called fracking, and shale wells uh, tend to drop in their output really fast after their initial burst. So obviously since the first peak, as time has gone on, more and more of our supply is being made up of unconventional, not cheap sources. And this thus has a cascading effect on everything else, obviously, as liquid fuels are used uh, to transport basically everything, and so thus it bears that cascading effect. Now oil's the centerpiece, although it's certainly not the only thing that this is happening to and will happen to. Because the same or a similar concept also happens uh, with mining metals and minerals. Global silver production peaked back in 2015. Global copper production is still rising. But similar to oil, the quality of resource being accessed is beginning to decline. Or rather, we're beginning to uh, mine places with less and less of a copper yield. We're constantly looking to start up more and more mining operations in the Arctic. And there's even some rare earth mining operations that are actually being considered in places like Afghanistan. So thus has begun this gradual baseline quality of life decline. At least, of course, for us, for the common people. So we're going to continue gradually going down this slope and are going to uh, slip off another step soon as global oil production is going to... Uh, hit its second and potentially final peak in the mid to late 2020s or so. And no, there's not going to be a magical Disney fantasy future where we just switch over to electric vehicles for everything and, every, and everybody's fine. There is not enough nickel in the world for all those batteries. We already covered that in a previous video. It's not going to work. Also, all renewable energy everything isn't going to work either. I mean, you could theoretically do it, but it's actually going to just make things a few factors worse because renewable energy is current energy. And no matter how advanced it may be, current energy is current energy and is stuck with the basic principles of current energy in that whether directly or indirectly, it requires a significantly larger feedback into itself to maintain access to it. Now, don't misread me, as some commenters have done in the past, or don't think I'm saying what I'm not. Is civilization going to collapse? No. Are we miraculously going to end up in a Star Trek-esque technological utopia? Also no. People, people always, not just dealing with this, but basically dealing with, uh, with anything, People always tend to split things up into two extremes and then jump to either of the two extremes. But reality is more complicated than that. No, there's not going to be a giant Doomer-esque collapse, but there's also not going to be a future Tectopia where we're all taking vacations on Mars either. Basically, it's just going to be the bland general downward trend of life gradually becoming less and less affordable as the energy and the resources continue losing their level of excess, thus becoming more expensive, and thus beginning to regrow the amount of time we have to redirect towards labor, 
to earn enough to spend on the energy and the resources. Technology will still keep improving, still keep getting newer. Everything will still keep going into the future. You know, the world will keep slowly looking more and more futuristic. But even as we continue to get more and more futuristic things, fewer and fewer people will be able to afford access to those things as they may have otherwise in an alternative reality. Now, the quality of life downslope won't keep going down forever. There is kind of a, a floor there. Instead of a ceiling that you can't break through, there's kind of a floor under us instead that a combination of coal and nuclear power won't let us go below. As long as we're still willing to use them, at least. But yeah, the good old days are gone, and they're not coming back. No matter what any politicians or political parties try to tell you, but that's what's really been going on, and why. I don't want it to be the case, but it unfortunately is. So despite the uh, not-so-lighthearted content of the video, I hope everybody enjoyed listening. If you did enjoy listening in, please like the video. Also, again, subscribe and hit the bell if you're not subscribed already. If you want to donate to help me out, paypal.me is in the description down below. You still have a short window between now and Christmas Eve, where, again, anyone who donates anything will get their name carved into a giant chunk of coal come Christmas time. But regardless whether you're watching, watching, or you come back from your other tab, here's some videos up on the end screen, some of the bigger, quote-unquote, more important ones that I've made. Or in some cases, just some of my personal favorites, some of the ones I liked making the most. But regardless of all else, and regardless of whatever becomes of me, I pray that God will bless all of your lives with security and stability. And I will see you all next time.